guys, and Shine. I'm back for weekend watches. I hope your weekend is off to a flying start. Today, if the show has a theme, it's grail watches, as we have never had quite so many on the table at one time. I should also remind you that I'm gonna give you a watch for your trouble. Link in the description, win that Panerai Luminor. Let's get started. You guys know my watch so well, I don't need to introduce my Zen Easy M11, but I am gonna start it up to keep tabs on our timing. Let's jump straight in with a grail watch. As promised, this is a timepiece that would easily headline any collection from one of the great brands. This is the 2010 Breguet Tradition 7047 Fusé Tourbillon, a timepiece in platinum, 41 millimeters, with a constant force fusé mechanism. It also features an extraordinary one minute tourbillon, a hidden power reserve scale for its 50 hour power reserve, absolutely incredible movement depth on the caliber 569. And you will note that every angle, though nostalgically finished in vintage form, is finished to the highest modern standards of watchmaking. The crystal is one of the most dramatically cambered and domed you will ever encounter, and you can see how rich is the attention to detail, as Breguet has even provided a little kerf or a slot below the crown so you can more easily slide your fingernail in. On the case back, remember, I told you this is a classically finished watch. The frosted finish is designed to be evocative of Breguet's own pocket watches. The design of the wheels and the spoke pattern, the use of separate individual bridges or half bridges, all of this is designed to evoke antiquity right down to the freehand engraved logo. But turn it back over and you can see that this is very much a modern watch, as Breguet has employed a solid gold, true rose lathe guilloche cut dial with fired Breguet steel hands, roll over to the tourbillon carriage and it is constructed of titanium. The tourbillon features an unusual application of a Breguet overcoil made out of silicon. Now, normally, silicon is created in essentially flat forms. So how is the overcoil architecture? for even and concentric beating possible? Well, it's a two-part overcoil. As you can see, there is actually a lower portion that is clipped into the upper portion, and Breguet fabricates them separately. Now, the timepiece does have a wonderfully vocal aspect. You can hear it, and I'm gonna throw it right up against the mic here. This one beats away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, and the timepiece features the classical Breguet tandem of straight welded lugs and a rolled or coined case flank. Now, when you wind the watch, watch the barrel and watch the fuse. The fuse works like bicycle gears. As the barrel winds down, it turns a larger circumference, thereby effectively giving it greater mechanical advantage. Now, as I wind the watch, you can see the chain, and there is a chain tens of centimeters long. You could see it wrapping around the fusée as I re-energize the power reserve. In fact, I'm gonna turn all of this over a little bit and show you better from this angle. You could see the constant force device, the fusée, is slowly being wrapped with the chain. The 50-hour power reserve is supremely impressive given the watch's rather frenetic complication, and in fact, it is effectively a triple complication with the fuse, the tourbillon, and that hidden stub power reserve indicator. Now you can better see from this angle the chain wrapping itself around the fuse. It's a long cone with a spiral leading to the top. Throw it on the wrist. The watch is surprisingly wearable. It's only 50.6 millimeters from lug to lug, and as a 41, it's not excessively large. It is thick at 16.3 millimeters, but a lot of that is the sapphire. It'll fit underneath most cuffs, just not the tightest of dress sleeves. Then again, would you really want a watch this gorgeous with a dial featuring that kind of depth to disappear? Yeah, I didn't think so. All right. That's enough time spent on one watch, but I feel like every one of these watches deserves its own opus and its own marathon. Let's go from something that I think is probably broadly admired by the audience to something that's gonna be very divisive. We're going Rolex, but Rolex as you've rarely seen it from the factory. With 124 factory brilliant cut gems. Now this diamond paved bezel sits atop a white gold Rolex Z series Daytona, so 2007. This is the reference 116589RBR. You also have diamonds on the dial, naturally larger diamonds in white gold settings, and a black lacquer dial base. This is gonna be a 
contentious cosmograph, no doubt, and it's featuring a strap that is likewise a little bit polarizing in high gloss, large rectangular scale alligator leather. Throw this one on the wrist and you can see it wears more easily than the same watch on a bracelet. And as with all factory strap Daytonas, there is a conforming end link piece to create a more integrated look. This is a surprisingly subtle diamond bezel because the farther you get away and Andrew, let's do a distance shot there, the less it reads like gems on the wrist. So I find that fewer and larger diamonds actually polarize opinion a little bit more. For me, the real bone of contention on this watch is not the bezel, but the dial. It's deeply provocative, and you need one hell of a panache quotient to pull this thing off. This is a watch that has to be worn with a straight face and confidence or not at all. Three-day power reserve, vertical clutch column wheel chrono, Fully loomed, by the way. Look at the hands at center, and of course, 100 meters water resistant. You're gonna to want to throw it on a water resistant band, but it is water resistant. A more traditional aquatic watch, however, would be this big boy, launched in 2007 in 1500 pieces in grade 5 titanium. This is the landmark Jager Le Coult Master Compressor Diving. GMT. Now the watch is 44 millimeters in grade 5 tie, which I appreciate because it's considerably more scratch and scuff resistant than standard grade 2. It also allows for polished highlights you can't achieve with grade 2, such as the diminishing bevel on the lugs of the timepiece. The lugs are broken out nicely, so though the watch is large and rather tuna can-like, it isn't monolithic in its construction. The bezel is a good one. Have a listen. Up against my mic. It's chunky and sharp, like a Panerai Luminor sub. Now, the watch also has the brilliant compressor crown system. One half turn, and it's unlocked. One half turn, and now you have 1,000 meters of water resistance. So the timepiece makes manipulation of the crown, which is rubber-coated, far easier when your hands are wet, sweaty, or gloved. Now, there are a few subsidiary setting modes once it's open. You have the ability to step the local hour hand independently, as there is a 24-hour GMT subdial at 9 o'clock. You can see how easy it is to jump the date in either direction as you traverse the international date line, and there is a constant operation indicator on the dial side, so you know the watch is running. It's not quite constant seconds, but it lets you know the watch is in operation. The timepiece is easy to wear, 44 millimeters in titanium. It's a big watch, but it's a light watch, and it's featured on JLC's superb bellows-style diving strap. Now turn it all over and you can see that there is the signature Geosphere cut of the Master Compressor watches. It's been through the 1,000 hours control, a fully cased up test of chronometry, water resistance, winding efficiency, and power reserve, and inside JLC's toughest movement, the Caliber 975 Auto Tractor, automatic 48 hour power reserve, full balance bridge, free sprung, nice and thick, it features over, well, it doesn't feature an overcoil, a flat hairspring of JLC's own design that is laser welded at the stud and the collet for stability. So not only free sprung with a full balance bridge like a Rolex, but with a laser welded hairspring at both ends of the spring so it cannot move. And the spring was made for JLC by Lange Uren, that is a Lange Unzona, a timepiece that represents JLC's best and toughest dive watch. Very few nods to nostalgia here, only on the matte dial, the Polaris style numerals as well as indices. That's the only nod to nostalgia. This is no retro watch, and you can see the color code for the crown. Blue, you're through. The crown is open, but white, you're tight. It's an easy 44 to wear, and I, rep I, I, I love that watch. I recommend it to everyone who wants a hardcore diving timepiece, but doesn't want to go vintage nostalgic and doesn't want to jump on the Rolex Omega Breitling bandwagon. Go JLC. The prices of those under 10 grand for a handmade watch are simply a steal for what you're getting. Titanium, but a steal. Now this is a timepiece that is in fact stainless steel, 904L stainless steel, one of the wackiest Rolex watches you will ever encounter. This is the Rolex 116000. Officially, it's an Oyster Perpetual 36, and they don't make them like this anymore. You can see there is a set of radially arrayed Arabic numerals in white with a blue border, tri-Arabics in white gold fully loomed. There is a round robin array 
of print on the dial. So normally, you see the block text on a dial of a Rolex. Here, it's been artfully wrapped around the center dial. And then the deep concentric gadroons. This is known as the concentric radial dial with a sunburst pattern in silver underneath the hour track. This is gorgeous, and it's anything but box stock Rolex, right down to its unusual domed bezel. A handsome watch that wears easily and 100 meters water resistant. This is a timepiece you can take just about everywhere. Not every version of the concentric dial is loomed, but this one is, making it exceptionally versatile. Now, on the wrist, my wrist is 16 centimeters circumference. It wears a bit more like a 36. It's 11.6 millimeters thick, so it slides under a cuff. 48-hour power reserve, COSC chronometer, and as I mentioned during the discussion the JLC, the Rolex 3130 in this watch is very, very tough by architecture. And the watch on a full oyster bracelet reads like a big boy Rolex. Though it is an entry-level model, this is everything you expect of Rolex in terms of toughness, precision, and perhaps unexpected quotient of design flair and individuality. If you want the Rolex that no one else has, you want the Rolex quality and heritage, but you don't want a Me Too watch. You want this watch. That said, there are some for which none shall suffice but high horology. And my personal favorite independent, again, it's right up there with the likes of HYT, Rescence, and Moser. I never quite know, but De Batoon of La Berson only makes Grail watches, which means the company fits perfectly with today's theme. This is the DB28 Zirconium Dark Shadow. 42.7 millimeters in almost scratch proof black zirconium. It's, it's feather light like aluminum is, but it's also scratch resistant like ceramic is. Now, the timepiece features spring-loaded floating lugs, so from 53 millimeters all the way out to 58. There's another set of lugs you can have fit to the watch during service if you want to permanently change its wrist geometry. On the dial side, a lot going on. You can see there is a Delta-style bridge over the twin mainspring barrel, six-day manual wind power reserve, triple shock protection, one, two, three shock protection springs with the springs at the edge of the Batoon patent, their own solid disc of silicon for the thermally resistant maximum inertia aerodynamic balance wheel. It has a white gold rim, and then you can see there's sort of a dog leg kink to the hairspring. It's their own hairspring design. There is also, though you can't see it, their own silicon escape wheel designed to minimize friction. Everything on this watch is proprietary, right down to the spherical half white palladium, half blued steel, 122 year moon phase. So this is a six day moon phase with triple shock protection of their own design. And when you turn it over, you can see it's also a power reserve as there is a large power reserve mechanism and scale on the reverse side with satin finished wheels and levers and engine turned perlage in a concentric pattern. Turn it all back over and you'll appreciate there is also a little stub stealth power reserve indicator ducking out from under the flange of the bezel. The little globes along the inner bezel are our indices, and you have a modified set of Breguet hands with a skeletonized aspect and black polish, and the bridge for the balance is completely rounded and black polished. Throw it on the wrist, it wears feather light. The spacing between the lugs is a burly 26 millimeters. So if you want to accessorize this one with a strap, you're going to go with 26 millimeters. The factory strap is of incredible quality as its alligator on the top and the bottom, two different scale sizes. The watch is stark. The watch is alien. The watch is monolithic. And I mean that in a Kubrickian sense. This is 2001 for your wrist, maybe even beyond, as De Batoon wasn't established as a watch brand until 2002. I know, terrible jokes right here, but I'm a sci-fi nut, and this watch tickles me pink. Or perhaps I should say, zirconium black. A bit more traditional and a little bit closer to my roots as a collector, we must discuss Jaeger Lecoultre, the best of Valet de Jeu watchmaking and the Grande Maison, or La Grande Maison, as folklore would have it. They do things that are simply timeless. At its best, JLC is a brand that follows no one's example. Now, this launched in 500 pieces for the year 2001 is officially known as the Platinum Reverso Number no. 1, the first of the line, and that dates back to the year 1931. So after 70 years, they came out with a Platinum Reverso, and they went all in. It features the Grand Tie case, and you'll note the true blue sapphire cabochon on the crown. The Grand Tie case is 42.2 by 26.2, only 9.8 millimeters thick, so it's slender in spite of the complexity of the caliber finishing, the depth of the and of course the reversible case. Now the movement is the ultra-thin caliber 849 
RSQ. RSQ for reverso or rectangular, SQ for skeletonized. So not only has it been hand skeletonized, and the movement is only 1.85 millimeters thick to begin with, but every individual component has been freehand engraved after being skeletonized. This is exceptionally difficult to do with a thin movement. Now, you can also see that the barrel itself has been skeletonized and engraved, and the spokes of the barrel are the JLC JL logo. Turn it all over and you can appreciate the reverse side. Now with the balance, it's amazing that this watch functions as it appears almost more performance art than high horology, but I assure you, the watch keeps outstanding time. And you can see the spokes of the barrel in the JL pattern rolling along as I wind the timepiece. And you'll also appreciate when you view it from an angle that the inner bezel has likewise been freehand engraved. So the interior of the platinum has also been freehand engraved and you could see the depth of the dial on both sides of the watch, exceptional depth with engraving of the flanks on both sides and the name of the company, Jager Lecoult, engraved on the inner bezel itself. Throw it on the wrist, it's a hefty little watch. 500 pieces in platinum, JLC doesn't short you the precious metal. It'll wear on a small wrist and I've owned two Reverso models in this case size, including the platinum Reverso number two that followed this first edition. The timepiece is also unique, relatively speaking. I wouldn't say it's unique, but it's unusual in that it features a full platinum PT950 clasp. This was back when JLC still gave you a platinum clasp with a platinum watch. Later on, when they went to the double folding clasps, 2006 onward, they would give you white gold on a platinum watch, and that is no bueno for me. I think it must match, which is why I like a lot of the older stuff JLC did better than some of the newer materials, simply by virtue of the standard equipment. Let's take a look at something that JLC offers that all of us can dig and many of us can afford. Another watch that I happen to own, and I did quite literally own this exact model, albeit on a strap. This is the mid 90s to early 2000s Master Moon. 37 millimeters in stainless steel. It features a glorious galvanized black sunburst dial. You can't quite see the sunburst pattern here, but rest assured it's present and correct. I will move the hands out of the way, but note the attention to detail. The Dauphine hands are half frosted for contrast against the black base. You have very traditional JLC calendar wheels as they were always red print on a white base. And this is dating back to the first quarter of the 20th century and their very first calendar wristwatches. A moon face, a lunette style pointer date, all of this easy to wear on an exceptional JLC factory beads of rice bracelet that is like silk on the wrist. One of the most comfortable bracelets I have ever encountered. And on the reverse side, go to the case back now, you could see JLC's no compromise caliber. It's an 889 base. Take note, adjusted in six positions, not five or fewer. Five is the chronometer standard, six was JLC standard back in the day. The winding mass, as you can see, is a 22 carat rose gold mass outboard of the winding rotor. Today, you'll see 21 carat or even tungsten used on JLC watches. And the screws are true fire blued or fire annealed screws. And there's a lovely circular Cote de Genève, not just across the rotor, but also across the movement itself. There is a considerable amount of hand finishing this watch of dial, case, bracelet, and movement. JLC always did more hand work on its movements in the 1990s and early 2000s compared to today. You will appreciate the distinctive reversing rocker system. Those two little jeweled wheels are a reversible rocker that reverses the bi-directional winding system. And so the 889s were always a bi-directional system. If you look closely, you will actually see the same mechanism in Audemars Piguet 3120s, as well as Nomos watches of the modern era. It was a good design then, it remains a good design today. Throw it on the wrist and it brings back great memories for me. A nice flat watch and any wrist can accommodate it. It's wonderfully compact at under 46 millimeters lug to lug. I can recommend this watch for a wrist as small as 13 centimeters circumference, but by all means, if you have a large wrist, this one has plenty of personality. This one has plenty of charisma and presence with a nice broad, full stance thanks to that bracelet. It reads larger than 37, but it wears an absolute treat on the wrist. And the watch looks wonderful from a distance. When you view it in the context of the full person, it's a timepiece that is just glorious in every respect. It looks different from anything else out there. It'll never be mistaken for a Rolex, an Omega, or a Breitling. Although, pointedly, it may be mistaken for a Patek or a Vacheron, and it deserves those comparisons. Jumping into something a little bit crazy from the folks on the other side of the border, crossing the border. 
with Alango Unzona. From Switzerland to Germany, from the Valais de Jeux to Saxony, this is the year 2010, 265 piece, 1815 F.A. Longa homage. It is a moon phase, and the timepiece is a glorious 37.4 millimeters in what was one of the earliest applications of honey gold by Alango Unzona. Somewhere between yellow gold and pink gold, it's a pale and hard alloy of 18 karat that is wonderfully scratch resistant for a gold. And here you can see a nod to nostalgia with a lovely rose lathe guilloche on the dial itself. It's an 1815 because of the Arabic numerals, so you know Saxonia is always the stick indices. The Roman numerals are Richard Lange, and the 1815 is the Arabic numerals. Solid gold moon phase disc. I should also mention that the dial itself is made of solid sterling silver. So the case is honey gold, the dial is sterling silver, and the moon phase disc itself is 22 karat gold. Turn it all over, things get even better. The homage is a a gorgeous watch on its reverse side, going above and beyond even Longa's standard of finish, as there's a lovely damaskining outboard, and you can see this isn't the conventional glasuta stripes. There is a radial satin finish underneath the damaskining, and then you'll note that there is a sunray pattern that explodes out from the chaton set jewel at center. You have German silver bridges, nickel copper zinc, with the copper giving it that golden hue, bridges and plates. You'll appreciate that there is freehand engraving on the bridges. And quite simply, it says Alango Unzona Glasuta. And it is freehand engraved just as the half bridge is embellished by freehand engraving. This is an extensively and obviously handmade and hand finished watch, right down to the mirrored anglage on the edge of the bridges and the engine turned perlage on the base plate. The attention to detail and manual execution here is outstanding. Black polished swan's neck regulator, black polished cap to the escape wheel, throw it on the wrist, and the watch is only 8.9 millimeters thick. So 37.4 wears a treat here. It's a traditionally sized men's dress watch, and you can see the distinctive pale tone of the honey gold, giving the watch a very different look than even a standard 1815. This is a watch that's a breed apart even by Longa standards, and with 265 made nine years ago, you're scarcely going to see one. If the Shishera Lekult guarantees you exclusivity at your office, this guarantees you the only one even at SIHH. What a machine. Jumping back across the Swiss border. I'm going to show you something familiar, but in an unfamiliar form. This is the Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5167, but it is the 1A on full bracelet. We're used to seeing the Aquanaut on a strap because the composite strap, as Patek calls it, bowed with the original Aquanaut back in 1997. Now this watch incorporates a bracelet more commonly associated with the Nautilus and the Aquanaut form, and the result is a 40 millimeter sports watch that's easier to wear than when it's equipped with the strap because on the full bracelet, the watch actually fits more easily on a small wrist as it's only about 48 millimeters end link to end link across the wrist with the bracelet. And the bracelet is more flexible than the strap. So whereas the strap fights you and flares out, the bracelet pulls right down around your wrist, making this an agreeable dance partner for those like myself with a smaller 16 centimeter circumference forearm. I would actually recommend this watch for wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. And it is paper thin compared to most other 120 meter sports watches, 8.3 millimeters thick. The dial is explosive, a geosphere cut, a little bit like what we saw on the back of the master compressor, but this one features a lovely silver to black gradient, so it's a sort of slate metallic at center with a sunburst, and then it fades to black at its outer edges. The hands as well as the numerals are white gold. It's just a lovely watch, and while it's not as extensively hand finished as the Nautilus, it trades at about half the price of a 5711 on the mark right now. You can see the case back, let me try to get the glare out of the way. It is a hand finished Patek Philippe 324 SC. Beautifully executed. This is all hand execution. The screws, the bevels, the bridges, the plates, this is not a mechanically finished movement. There is as much hand finishing and hand regulation on the Aquanaut caliber as there is on the identical caliber in the Nautilus. So you're not trading down with movement finish or spec. And I should mention that somewhere between one quarter and one third the cost of producing this watch is going to be in that movement and it's finishing. You can see extensive attention was paid to the dial and it is a very handsome timepiece with a bewitching dial that justifies the price of the watch as well as the hype surrounding it. 
I would actually go with a full bracelet Aquanaut over a Nautilus at this moment in time. It's just that much less crazy, and I don't think you're giving up that much watch, to be honest. That said, you can also buy an Omega Aquaterra and come out ahead of everyone. Speaking of Omega, this was the watch of 2018. There is no doubt that the 25th anniversary Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter was a revelation. The seemingly impossible task of reinventing a hallowed classic without angering the purists or alienating a new generation. Well, they pulled it off, and the watch you see here was upgraded from 41 millimeters to 42. The dial was changed a bit. The Omega Wave retained after a hiatus from 2012 to 2017. It was a lacquer dial in between, but the original Wave dial bowed with this model back in 1993 in its first version, and it's back, albeit here in a ceramic with a chromium plate, a laser cut used to create the waves themselves. The date moves from three o'clock down to six. The hands are larger, the indices are larger, and you now have cold enamel or white enamel inside the gloss blue ceramic insert, a newly reprofiled helium escape valve. It changes its appearance. It looks a little bit like a Reese's peanut butter cup now. It's conical. And for the first time, you can open it during a dive if you may need it. The bezel action is good, but it's still shallow. So it's best to use the bezel and set the time before you get this wet. The detent is better than it's ever been, but because of the shallow profile of the actual knurling itself, it's not the easiest bezel to grip. That said, turn it over, all is forgiven. For the first time on a serial production, Diver 300 meter, you can see the movement and the whole movement. The watch features caliber 8800 coaxial, Matos chronometer, amagnetic, 300 meters, helium escape valve, 55 hour power reserve, throw it on the wrist, easy to wear, 13.7 millimeters thick, it's a 42. The watch is now 50 millimeters lug to lug, and this is a wonderful strap that was debuted with the model. It features two raised striations, a lovely frosted base and satin finish on the stripes. They really sweated the details here, and you can tell because when you go right down to the pin buckle, you could see that they redesigned the pin buckle expressly for this model. And the pin buckle bevel on the flank actually matches the bevel on the lug. That that is the attention to parallelism and design symmetry. And that's a watch you can pick up for low 3000s, one of the best values pre-owned. It's a great value new, but with the five-year warranty on a watch that just came out last year, I think pre-owned is the way to go with that model. And I own the original a 2531 version of that watch. When you buy it, you keep it. You rotate through your watches, but that will be a constant in your collection. Now, here's something we have never featured on the show. I wanted to go with Grail watches, but I didn't want all the usual suspects. And for $17,000, this is one of the best truly handmade tourbillon values you'll find. Launched in 2009, the Corum Tie Bridge, now in titanium, takes the classical Corum Bridge baguette movement and adds twin mainspring barrels, RCAP bridges, a 72 hour power reserve, an open work to architecture with bracing for the barrels, the 72 hour power reserve driving a flying tourbillon with no upper bridge at 21,600 vibrations per hour with the classical Corum La Chaux de Fonds double key logo atop the tourbillon carriage. Note that it's also satin finished with black polished screws fixing it to the tourbillon. It also features loomed hands at the center. The watch also includes a cambered case back. So as with a shared mill tonneau case, there's a curvature to trace the arc of the wrist, and it's actually a fairly friendly curved 52.5 millimeters from lug tip to lug, lug tip, with a wonderful evacuated and somewhat relieved inboard flank and polished outer chamfer that gives the case a wonderful hand-finished, handmade sort of air about it. This is a very different look for Corum. Techno-industrial, but it never seems like an industrial product. It's industrial in sensibility. Now you can see, the Corum key on a lacquered insert outboard, throw it on the wrist. This is a watch for 17,000 bucks pre-owned that I endorse quite simply because you're getting a legitimate high luxury tourbillon. This is not the Tag Heuer tourbillon. This is not some Memorigen watch that costs a few hundred bucks. This is from a great manufacturer that's largely an art house by reputation, but Corum of La Chaux de Fonds, established in the mid 1950s, has made up for lost time and a lack of an ancient heritage by doing things that are outstanding and a little bit outlandish. From the original Golden Bridge in 1980 to the prior decades Rolls Royce watch to the coin watches 
stretches of the 1960s right up to the tie bridge, Coram pushes the limit of what a design house can accomplish with the standard features and standard elements of watch design language. So the watch on the wrist is not just a bargain alternative to conventional tourbillon watches, but it actually pulls off a wonderful Richard Mille killing profile, and unlike RM, which principally uses Vauche bases and Dubois de Praz modules, this is all Coram's own movement, hand finished in house. The bridges are made of R cap, which is an alloy of nickel, copper, zinc, tin, and remarkably corrosion resistant and anti magnetic. So there's a wonderful technical basis for even the materials that are used. Now, of course, the watch features a display case back, but not really necessary in this instance, as the form of the baguette movement is visible from the underside, and it is handsomely frosted, so there's also some handsome finish on the underside. Take note, this is number 18 of 80, so this is a small pool of watches. If you want exclusivity and you want complication and hand assembly at a good value price, this is a wonderful way to do it, and at 50 meters, it's just swimmable. One of the few 50 meter watches I can say is swimmable only because Corum has said that itself. Now let's jump to something that is not swimmable, but spectacular. Let's talk about Arnold & Son. Officially, Arnold & Son is owned by the Citizen Empire of Japan, and it's powered by the La Jupere manufacturer, which is one of the most complete and accomplished full line, full component, full movement manufacturers in Switzerland. And this, launched in 2018, is the TBTE. It is the True Beat Tourbillon, a watch that simply defies superlatives. If you thought the Breguet had impressive dial depth, well, think again, because this is the new standard for today's show. Note that not only is the watch blessed with incredible dial depth, but if you can show me, Andrew, if you can gain focus on the inner bezel, the inner bezel is mirror finished, creating the appearance of an endless movement volume internally. And you can see that all the way around. Now the movement, we should talk about the movement because the base plate is entirely guilloche rose lathe turned. So they have done that on both sides, creating a radiating rose lathe motif from the center, inspired by John Arnold pocket watches of antiquity. They have a battle axe bridge for the true beat system, and you can see the nautical symbol of Arnold and Son with the anchor the counterweight of the spring-loaded detent system that operates the true beat or the deadbeat seconds mechanism on the dial side. Also take note that on the dial side, every pivoting component from the barrel to the motion works, to the tourbillon, to the train beneath has its own separate bridge. And also appreciate that many of these bridges in alternating pattern are black polished on their top. They use white gold chaton that are press fit into the pivot points, and you can see them. They are press fit into the pivot points, so you have those wonderful nostalgic pocket watch style jewel chaton. You also have a balance beating away at 21.6, the true beat or dead beat seconds complication with a lovely elongated hand on a handsome dished flange or ray hot. And look at the references to the pocket watch era. Andrew, get as close as you can here, but you could see that internally the wheels use beveled spokes. This is one of the rarest types of finishing in all of high horology because it's so difficult to accomplish and even high-end collectors don't expect to see mirror polished bevels inside of wheel spokes. It's also impressive that they use a tri-spoke pattern designed to evoke John Arnold pocket watches and if you look very close you can see that the teeth on the ratchet wheel above the barrel and the skeletonized barrel, the teeth of the ratchet wheel are wolf's tooth teeth, another reference to the pocket watch era that creates a wonderfully creamy winding action for the watch. The tangential contact of the wolf's tooth tip means that the watch has a super refined winding feel, and you can see that the click is enormous. It's been chamfered on its edge. It is a Baroque style click on the dial side of the watch. It's basically an inverted movement with everything visible on this side. Black polish, guilloche, satin finish, you get it all. And despite the power intensive complications, a 72 hour power reserve. Now the watch 
is an underrated gem because though it's 44 millimeters in diameter, it's only about 12.4 millimeters thick, so it's very flat. And thanks to Arnold and Son's distinctive, tightly curved lugs, at only 50.8 millimeters lug to lug, I can wear this watch on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist, and I can even recommend wearing this watch on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference. So it has the ergonomic equation nailed. One more note that I'm gonna throw out there is the finish of the watch. As you can see, the case band is black polished in rose gold. And then you can see that there is a raised center to the lug flank that is then satin finished with longitudinal satin finish. And that raised step on its flank is also mirror beveled. This is a beautifully made watch and not just internally, on the case flanks as well, hand finished inside and out with exquisite attention to detail. And the watch is a limited edition of 28 pieces from 2015. Note how they even used a longitudinal striation or a brushing on the hands themselves. So half of the hand features a longitudinal brushing to increase the contrast against the dial base. It's a little bit easier to see when I remove the superimposed factor. Now you can see that one half of each hand, and by the way, the hands come to an exquisite point, but one hand, each hand has that half frosted, half grained side. That is an amazing watch and a truly underrated brand. Arnold & Son needs to be discussed in the same breath as Zenith, Glasuta Original, Langa, Jeger Le Cult, and I would even say in many respects Patek Philippe because their finish gives up nothing to Patek, their innovation in design, certainly Patek Philippe would never build a watch that looks like this, and the level of the engineering, the finish, the audacity, and the final executed product deserves a comparison to Patek. That said, there are those for whom nothing less than the genuine article will do. And that's why we're discussing the lush, Patek Philippe 5320G, 40 millimeters in white gold. It has a stepped bezel and a sharply broken out set of four lugs with a triple Gadron striation borrowed from the historical reference 2405. This is my favorite Patek Philippe perpetual calendar. And a lot of that's down to the combination of the sharp lugs, the wearable 40 millimeter size, the cream lacquer dial. It's not faux tina, it's just, an, it's just a handsome color. It was chosen because it's warm, it's humane, it's accessible and relatable white gold numerals that are blackened, syringe style hands that are themselves blackened, a moon phase, aperture for the day as well as the month, leap year cycle indicator, day night indicator, radial date, turn it all over, and you've got a caliber 324 SQ for Seconds and Contiem, or Contiem Perpetuel. Perpetual calendar, but it's also Patek Philippe seal with Gyromax free sprung balance and a silicon hairspring. So rated to minus three plus two seconds per day or better. White gold, handsome, easy to wear, and a wonderful pleasure at only 11.1 .1 millimeters thick. It slides underneath any cuff and it wears a treat. It looks fantastic. It's one of the least common Patek Perpetuals. And I really do feel like this is one of the company's best modern styling efforts. Externally, it's the 2405, whereas on the dial side, it's evocative of 1940s and 1950s Patek Philippe perpetual calendars, like the old 1526. Okay, jumping into the Patek Philippe Hall of Fame. This is a watch we have not had on the show, the white gold variant of the 5070. Now the 5070 bowed, inspired by a 1950s 46 millimeter reference 2512, but it bowed in 1998, the 5070J in yellow gold. It was huge at 42 millimeters for a Patek Philippe chronograph. The watch has worn well and adapted well to changing tastes, precisely because it was designed right the first time with a wonderfully bold size, a dial, despite its visual tricks to disguise the small size of the movement, the the dial actually endears it to me more than the properly sized dial and movement tandem of the later 5170. The stepped pagoda-like bezel is lovely and lush. I love the nostalgic hallmark stamping on the flank of the lugs, and you can see how sharp are the bevels of the lugs of this watch. You'll note this one doesn't look like a museum piece because it's been worn, but it has not been polished. And this is the first thing that goes when a 5070 gets polished. It's the crispness of the bevel 
on the lug and the step on the lug, and this watch has lost none of that power. Blackened hands and numerals. Take a look at the hands. You can see evidence of the original fire annealing to blacken the hands over a flame. You can see there's a little bit of a gradient and a prism of rainbows radiating out from the hands. You can see that this was not an industrial product, but executed manually in the old school fashion. Turn it all over. The CH2770, based on the Le Mans 2310, manual wind, Geneva Hallmark, 18,000 vibrations per hour, Gyromax free sprung, overcoil hairspring. It is a traditional column wheel lateral clutch chronograph. You can see the levers in steel with a satin finish and beveled edges interacting with the capped and black polished column wheel. I can move the clutch into and out of contact with the chronograph bridge at center, and then I can recenter it, dropping the heart cams. You could see just how beautifully everything is blackened and beveled by the amount of gloss, gleam, and black surfacing you see when I turn this one oblique to the camera. Throw it on the wrist, and the 42 still wears with enormous power, charm. I would even say a magnetic, hypnotic appeal. You can't make rational choices when looking at this watch. It is a purely emotional appeal, built from 2002 to 2006 in white gold. Only about 250 were made per year per metal, meaning this is an extraordinarily rare watch, and the original metal and intact case lines of this exact example make it a rarity even among the precious few that were originally manufactured. That said, if you are going Geneva High Horology, Poinçon de Genève, and perhaps even chronometer certification, you need not go with the orthodox safe choices. The usual suspects are appreciated, but Let's go a bit unorthodox, even heretical. What if you put wacky features on a Geneva Hallmark watch? What if you went by retrograde? And what if you did it outside the umbrella of the groups and the majors? Well, in 1995, Roger Dubuis and Carlos Diaz did exactly that. Roger Dubuis, long watchmaker at Patek Philippe and a complication specialist, launched Sogem, the company that would become Roger Dubuis. Now, the watch that you see here is 37 millimeters rose gold. It is the homage and it is a perpetual calendar by retrograde with moon phase. And you can see that this is a lovely hand-painted lacquered moon phase because you can see the imperfections of the paint, the sign of human touch. The dial is wonderfully black lacquered with an exceptional gloss and gleam. The timepiece featuring Geneva Hallmark on its caliber 5.7, 57 is a Longines L990, double mainspring barrel, ultra thin, automatic winding, adjusted in five positions like a chronometer. You can see the modifications, including rich Cote de Genève, chamfer on the edges of the bridges, black polished screws, and a black polished swan's neck index with perlage on the base plate. You can see the hallmark of Geneva on the base plate adjacent. And if you look carefully at the top of the watch, you might be able to see that it says Bulletin d'Observatoire. The Bulletin d'Observatoire is quite simply the observatory bulletin of the Besançon Observatory. So the bulletin, or Bulletin d'Observatoire is a chronometer certificate, not for the movement, for the whole watch. And the watch went through the two-week test governed by the ISO 3159, like the COSC, but whereas the COSC is a bare test of the movement, this was a test of the full watch. So you have an observatory chronometer with the French certification, Geneva Hallmark, Roger Dubuis' own complication module made in-house, and then Geneva Hallmark modification of a Longines L990 or Breguet 8810 base. The terms are used interchangeable, 8810 or Longines 990. But aside from your observatoire, you have the atelier of Grubel Forsy, and it does not get any more intense than the 24-second tourbillon. Launched in 2007, this is Grubel Forsy design and finish at its best. I haven't wound it yet because I want you to see all the details of the tourbillon cage, which weighs less than four-tenths of one gram. It's inclined at 25 degrees because Grubel Forsy research has found that 25 degrees of incline on a wristwatch tourbillon produces the same kind of chronometric precision as a stationary tourbillon in an old school pocket watch. So we finally have a wristwatch tourbillon that gives gives you the advantages of cancelled gravitational deviation. Now I want to start the watch up. It's a manual wind, three-day power reserve. Andrew, follow the tourbillon carriage as I wind it up. We'll power this one up. And you can see, once it starts beating, 
It is a 21.6 beat rate. It has an overcoil hairspring, and it features a huge, towering bridge for the tourbillon carriage with completely rounded, if we can show the, the bridge itself, completely rounded and black polished bridge spans. You can also see the movement depth. The movement itself is 9.65 millimeters deep. And if you look at the watch from the side, you have absolute visual access to the tourbillon carriage as it completes its pirouette in poetic fashion around the dial. You'll also note that the watch is pretty thick. At 16.3 millimeters, it's not a thin watch, but at 43.5 millimeters, it's one of the most wearable Grubel 4C timepieces. Almost exactly 51 millimeters lug to lug. Take a look at the concave profile and mirrored finish of the lugs themselves. The case contouring of a Grubel 4C, and I will remove my fingerprints so you can see it to better advantage, but the case contouring of a Grubel 4C is the best in the industry. The standard of manufacture with the lugs welded on and then the evidence of the weld removed from between the vertical satin finished flank and the polish of the mirror finished lug, that's hand finishing right there, that seamless joint. And the fact is the bezel as well as the case back are superimposed over the mid case to give it even a little bit of a relieved depth when viewed from the side. The case back features German silver, or since we're in, since we are in La Chaux de Fonds with Grubel 4C, we will call them My Chaux Bridges. Jewels set in chaton, pocket watch style. You have a frosted finish, pocket watch style. You have that My Chaux material, pocket watch style. You have hand finished, beveled and satin finished, hand engraved and inked individual name plates and number plates. You have nine interior angles, and that is sparing no expense. Those sharp interior angles where two chamfered edges meet, the toughest finishing assignment in all of watch embellishment with some of the largest fire annealed blue screws you will ever encounter. You could see that there are bevels on the edge of the bridges, Cote de Genève at center, engine turned perlage on the base plate, and when you throw it on the wrist, it actually wears quite easily. The dial is made of solid gold, and it is then galvanized to create that slate gray. There is a power reserve, and the power reserve index, that is the actual scale, across from which you read the power reserve needle. That is made of solid gold, and the timepiece has a wonderful ergonomic fit. As you can see, even on my smaller wrist, it's not actually over the edge of my wrist. I could wear this watch comfortably, and Andrew, if you'll zoom in on the tourbillon right there, you could see that the reason a Grubel 4 watch is so big and so deep is so you can appreciate that which Grubel 4 has provided, regulated, engineered, and finished it's there for your viewing pleasure and no one else's. That is why a Grubel 4C watch is large, for the owner's enjoyment first and foremost. And that, my friends, <laughs> is about as good as it gets. I have nothing on the table that can surpass that chronometric crescendo. I'm back in with my Zin. Guys, thank you so much. Thanks to my crew. Link in the description. Win that Panerai Luminor. Like, comment, subscribe, all of the above. Thanks to you. Thanks to Andrew and my crew, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.